Good morning. Good morning, and welcome uh, to the Harvard Law School. Can you hear me? My boss, uh, Martha Minow, the dean here, uh, asked me to express her regrets that a long scheduled appointment has got her out of town today, and she has asked me to stand in her shoes. Um, I think for three reasons. Uh, one is that until uh, a few months ago, I was her academic vice dean, and therefore have some relationship to the work uh, of this conference. But there are two other reasons. Uh, the first is uh, that I think she knows that I was the first member of the Harvard Law School faculty to have a computer in his home. <laughs> and that was in the 1970s. Uh, and no credit to me, uh, I had a computer in my home because my older son, then a high school student, was a volunteer in the artificial intelligence lab at MIT, and they gave him a computer to put by his bed and his own telephone line, pretty heady stuff for a 15-year-old, and the computer was the sort where you had a telephone that plugged into the side. And at that time, there was no internet. He worked on the ARPANET. And he began my education in computers. And my final qualification uh, is uh, with you, because I was using Cali exercises. This is the 40th anniversary of when I started using Roger Park's professional responsibility uh, exercise. And maybe John can explain to me how I was using a Cali exercise in 1974 before there was Cali. <laughs> So I, I guess I can say uh, my qualification for welcoming you is that I was there before the beginning. <laughs> and I am very grateful to Roger Park because he got me interested and sold me on um, the importance of the work that we're all doing today. Uh, and Roger is not here. Uh, he, he is my former student, uh, and he became my colleague and my very good friend, and I am very grateful to him. And my instructions were to be brief in my welcome, and so I shall carry out those instructions. Welcome. Have a wonderful conference. All right, thank you very much. So 1974, we will be sending you a bill for the time between 1974 and 1982 when we incorporated. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, welcome to the conference. Hey. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the executive director of Cali. And I'm here to welcome you for Cali's sake and also do all the necessary housekeeping and sort of uh, get, get, things, uh, get things going. This is our 24th conference. Had no idea 24 years ago that I would still be standing up here doing this. <clears throat> OK. I've been to a lot of conferences. Um, and I'm a little obsessive compulsive. And so I save the name badges that come with those conferences. This is a picture of the bulletin board in my office where I stick all those. Of course, I've got you know, all the conference uh, uh, badges from last year and the year before with the minifigs. You know, I've uh, been to zillions of ALSs and ALLs. Uh, that's not all of them. 
Um, I even saved the, the badges when I was at my high school reunion and uh, you know, my college reunion. Um, and I was a juror a couple of years ago too. <laughs> but the point I want to make is, you know, yes, this is yet another conference, but this one is different. This is not just a conference, it's a community. It's not just a community, it's a group of people who I consider to be my friends, even those of you I haven't met yet. And I'm really happy that you're here. So uh, we're really happy to be here at Harvard. And, and this is sort of like how I want to sum it all up, right? Deep thoughts. Yesterday is history, today, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That is why it is called the present. Hmm. <laughs> Deep words from Master Ugwe from Kung Fu Panda. <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> so, I have to thank a lot of people, and I'll promise to do it fast, but, but, but listen to me, because these people are important for uh, what they've done. Here's all the sponsors that we've gotten for the conferences, and we are deeply grateful for them being here. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to visit them. I'll explain that in a second. Um, I'm always worried that they'll think, oh, my name's on the bottom, and so I've got an alternative one, which I've shuffled <laughs> things around. And then for those people who say, well, I'm in the middle, and then I was in the bottom, I said, fine, I shuffle them again. <laughs> so thank you, all of, these, all of these sponsors, for your support. Uh, we, we couldn't do certain uh, upgrades and cool things uh, without you. Um, I hope you, as sponsors, uh, if you're any of you are in the room or listening, will attend the sessions. You don't have to sit at your tables all day long, um, um, because we think that you're part of this community, and we can learn from you. So thank you for that. So we've got a piece of paper in your materials. It's, uh, it, it, it's to encourage you to visit the sponsors. When you visit them, they'll give you a sticker. When you get one, two, three, four, five stickers, you can stick it into a box. What room is the box going to be in? The registration room? Is that a fair? Yes. Probably, yeah. All right. So, so, so find the registration room and stick it in there. And we have a raffle with all kinds of cool stuff to raffle off. Tetris lamps and Samsung gear and uh, iPad minis and Chromecasts, including uh, what's not shown here is four iPads and some and ten shuffles, ten iPod shuffles, um, given over to us by uh, the Free Law Coalition slash Just Yeah. Thank you, Tim Stanley. Appreciate that. And of course, thank you, Harvard Law School, for having us. The birthplace. Uh, let me think. I guess the University of Minnesota could be the mother, Harvard could be the father of, Har of Cali. Um, I am especially appreciative because I wouldn't have a job if Harvard hadn't come up with this idea of a consortium of law schools that would be like a Bell Labs for technology and legal education. <laughs> you also have in your badges uh, a, uh, what do you call it, a little, little card that has some numbers on it. So those numbers should be sort of familiar. Um, if you've ever played the game um, 2048, I think, or 1024. Yeah, let me... yeah, I can't get it to work, but you know what I mean. <laughs> of course it locks up. So, so it's, a, it's sort of a version of that game, but it's, but, it's, but it's intended to be a social game, right? We want you to meet other people. You cannot stay in your shells while you're at this conference. So the first one's almost a gimme. You've, what, basically what you do is you work your way through the numbers, you look for the, somebody who has a two, and if two people who both have a two available, then you mark that off. Then you go look for somebody who has a four, and no, you can't use the same person who, who now has the four, of course, right? You, so that means you have to go meet 10 people. Nerds, you have to get out of your shell and meet people, <laughs> all right? Now how many of you are first time at this conference? Holy smoke, that's like 20%. So all of you are first time, stand up. Yep, stand up. All right, stay standing. Now everybody else, I want you all to turn to them and say, hey, welcome to the conference. All right, you can sit down, thanks. So this is aimed at, this is aimed at you new people. This is a way to get to talk to people. Now don't just go up and get numbers. But okay, you're, you're gonna wanna go up and get numbers because when you get to the last one, then I want you to write your name and email address on the back and then put that into a box that we'll have at registration as well because we've saved over one of the cool prizes, a, whoops, a GoPro, 
that we will raffle off to all the people that finish meeting 10 people at this conference. Right? It's our little social game. All right. So last year, you might remember, uh, we had the reception at uh, Sears Tower. That is a real picture taken the night before the reception. <laughs> This year, we're at the Harvard Faculty Club. There's a map that shows that it's not in this building. It's uh, all the way across campus. Just wanted to warn you, it's a 10 or 15 minute walk, right? Luggage may be stored in 3016 on Saturday, but you better pick it up by 2 p.m. or it will be raffled at next year's conference. <laughs> Lunch is not in the same place as breakfast was. It's over in front of E. Langdell, Langdell Hall. No, I think it's E. Langdell Hall. Um, in a, in, a, in a big tent, all right? How do I know it's a Lang the Elaine Del Hall? I went and took a picture, there it is. <clears throat> and it wasn't as funny as I thought it was gonna be. All right, <clears throat> Harvard Law Library tours, Thursday and Friday at 12 and 12.30, meet outside Elaine Del Hall. Tours for tech? Um, tech tours meet at noon downstairs at the lobby. Here the Both Thursday and Friday? Um, just today, tech tours, noon in the lobby. There's a big lobby, is it just the big lobby? Yeah, the big lobby downstairs. All right, the big lobby downstairs. Good, the hashtag for the conference is CaliCon14. Tweet away, set your phones to vibrate. Please do not disturb the hard work of the speakers, who I forgot to thank. Thank you, speakers, for, for uh, talking at this conference, for taking the time to do that. So remember to set your phone so that you don't disturb everybody. There's a 60% chance that you have the wrong size t-shirt, right? So wait till after lunch and you can go to the registration area and trade it in for something smaller or larger, all right? So Jason Scott. Is that right? Must hydrate. One more. All right, bring it up. Actually, while you're, while you're bringing it up, I also wanted to say, so you probably noticed something, right? Um, no funny masks, no kooky outfits that I'm wearing this time, no Lego heads. You know, uh, we were looking at the evaluations and somebody said, you know, it's not real professional for a conference of our stature and age. To, uh, you know, to have John wearing uh, Halloween costumes and stuff like that. So, you know, I felt a little bad about that. So, um, <clears throat> so I decided to go. <laughs> We're not going to do that this year. <clears throat> what? All right. Elmer, you got those? Um... I do. I have them. All right. Good. I asked Levon. Yeah. Well, I added some stuff on the bottom this morning. So. All right. I'll start from the bottom until I get something that's the same as what I sound. Please silence all devices. Did that. Lunchtime discussions and meetings begin at noon, so you have enough time to stroll over to the tent and grab some food, right? Lunch starts at 11.30. That gives you that half hour to get the food and bring it back to whatever room that there might be uh, one of those lunchtime meetings, right? We had more people proposing sessions this year than, than any other year. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we just couldn't say no, we would stick, we stick people into the lunch slot, which I know is exhausting, right? You're going to a whole day of conferencing and we're going to bug you during lunch. But um, if, if, that's your, uh, you know, if that's your caffeine, then, then those sessions are available to you. Sessions are being recorded. That's right. Thanks for reminding me. Sessions are being recorded, but not live streamed, except for the keynotes. But what that means is that if you're standing around a microphone, that's going to end up on your permanent record on YouTube and the NSA databases. So careful who you criticize, unless it's intentional. Uh, media services tech tour. There are still seats available for the Virtual Box and Linux Mint workshop Thursday afternoon. That's today from 1 to 5 in room 3008. Bring your laptops for a fun afternoon. Good, covered it all. All right, thanks. No, appreciate it. Jason Scott is a man of many hats. That's what I noticed looking up his bio and trying to figure him out. I love that. I love your hats. Those are cool. 
He is the uh, 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 director, maker, everything. everything on the documentary BBS, which has uh, at least an hour or two with Lauren Jones, who was a, uh, my colleague from 1987 to 1991 in Chicago, Kent, where we got him to set up the first, no, I don't know if it was the first, but we set up a BBS for Chicago, Kent College of Law. Almost nobody used it, but it was a blast to play around with our BBS PC on that. He's also the uh, sysadmin, the head guy at textfiles.com, whoopsie daisy, and he's a rogue archivist for archive.org. I really can't describe anything else about him, and so I'll let him take it from here. Jason? Nothing in life comes free, so technically, we are doing a semi-complicated audio-visual switch the amount of material involved, hopefully, will be just simply this machine going like this and never crashing. However, dreams never do come true. That part worked, um, which is good. And let's press this. And that worked. Let's press this and see if that works. All right. That's wonderful. So, um, so before I start, a big shout out to the people who couldn't make it, who are on the, as I just verified in the front, wonderfully recorded uh, live stream. I really appreciate you stopping in on your morning from wherever you are, here or around the world. Um, and thank you to everyone else who came in in body form to be here. Uh, I hope that I am as entertaining in the flesh as I am online uh, while something else is going on but you are more than permitted to do other stuff while I'm doing this. All right, anyway, so um, we didn't work out the title until yesterday morning. I mean, that was pretty nice. I like the idea of a dynamic what's on my mind thing. So the house is on fire, the fire truck is on fire, the fire is on fire. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about what I do, why I do it. Um, I have an anger-based job. It's actually worked out very well for me. And so you're going to be hearing me sound somewhat strange, somewhat cynical, but I'm also extremely hopeful. And so, you know, you'll get used to it or you won't. So um, when people ask me what I do, um, one of my favorite current titles is Angel of Death. And what that means is that when something's going on online and I show up, it's a bad sign. Um, because it means that I am somewhere in the vicinity and maybe what this, what's going on is not so good. Um, you know, when the web started um, in the early 90s, it was an experiment, a really awesome experiment, and we had a lot of people doing a lot of interesting things, and over time, commerce and law and society kind of came in, and it's interesting how the online world has amplified some parts and diminished the others, and so one of the side effects of that is that ongoing content uh, has now really ballooned, and we don't quite know where it's going to go, and I'm at the intersection. Um, it's very nice when you get a puppy, but it's not so good when you have to do something with the 20-year-old dog, and I'm in the world of the 20-year-old dog, and unfortunately, 20-year-old dogs on the internet last about two years. So um, when I'm showing up outside your window, it's a pretty bad sign. Um, I work at the Internet Archive. Uh, the things that I'm saying now are not representative of the opinions of the Internet Archive, and they would be horrified to hear anything that comes out of my mouth. Um, but um, I work here. This is the actual building that it is in. Um, it is a um, renovated Christian science church in San Francisco, and the uh, whole place is run by my boss, Brewster Kale, who's a bit of an internet saint, a wonderful guy. I am privileged to work with him. He is a visionary and a really, really techy, um, emotion-filled man. Um, he will speak about trying to get the best prices on disk drives, and then we'll turn around and talk about the betterment of humanity and mean it, which is an interesting change from usual. Um, the Internet Archive, as was just pointed out, is a pleasant site that allows you to acquire a whole bunch of materials, but everything from older websites to uh, movies to books and audio, and I'm in charge of software as well, vintage software, and we basically provide it for free to millions of people a day um, all around the world. All sorts of functions. It functions as a library. We're probably one of the only top 200 websites that keep no logs of who's uh, coming to us, and uh, we, we basically maintain an attitude of we are a library. When we got a secret uh, order to uh, have somebody um, 
to have some person's information given out. Um, the Internet Archive sued the US government and won and got the permission to say that they were being subpoenaed. Um, the inside of the building is actually rather interesting. Um, if you look up in the corners in the smudgy darkness that's in this room with the lights, can we turn that light down? Is there any chance of that? Actually, everyone's looking at me. I will give you, I will give you, I don't know, an e-donut if you're able to use that thing. If you go back, if you go back, there's a menu and every single aspect of this room from temperature, heat, love, and lights can be controlled from there. And when it goes wrong, it's going to be terrible. So, you're not having a heart attack, we're just putting the lights down. So in the, so in the back there, if you look in the back, there's actually some servers in the back of the church. And each one of those servers on the left and the right is about three petabytes of data. Uh, in total, the Internet Archive has 19 petabytes of unique content with a grand total of 45 petabytes of disk space. So think of us as a USB drive on steroids that haven't been invented yet. Um, and since we don't have stock options, if you work at the Internet Archive for three years, they build a little statue of you. <laughs> so here's some of my coworkers hanging out. So yeah, I'm, I'm due my statue, hint, hint, out to the Internet. The, there's, there's a better shot of the servers. These are called petaboxes. Each one is a petabyte, and every time a little blue light blinks, somebody saw something horrible. Or great, have no idea, not watching them. Um, so we also record all television. Um, if you go to um, archive.org and click on TV news up in the corner, you can do a text search of television news going back three years with an instant link to where it was spoken an incredible tool which not enough people know about. Um, but we are also recording all television. Um, we also ingest weird old video, weird old audio, you know, basically. So we are in the ingestion business, putting it online, making it available. So anyway, I love this. And I love that I'm working there and it's a wonderful time. Um, we also scan books. Uh, we have been scanning books for years. We have over one million, actually now we're up past two million books online. We partner with libraries, including Harvard. Uh, to scan books and make them available. Um, and we have this scribe system that enables us to digitize a book in five minutes. Um, and to prove it, I use this Braille edition of Playboy. <laughs> it turns out that uh, the government for a long time funded Braille editions of magazines, so this is literally you reading Playboy for the articles. <laughs> and by the way, the scan, is awful. Everybody thought I was insane for doing it, but it does stick in your mind, doesn't it? But uh, scanning Braille, not an effective long-term strategy. <laughs> and here's the inbox of the books that we are sent. So each one of those is about six feet high. And that is a lot of books that are being scanned. Um, anyway, let's talk a little bit about uh, nuclear waste. The um, all right, so this comes from a thing called the 99% Invisible Podcast. Um, I knew about this story, but they did it in much more detail, so I credit it to them. So here's, you got a problem here right now, right? Which is that nuclear waste lasts a very long time. In fact, they expect that the radiation isn't really safe for about 250,000 years. Well, we've only been around for about 5,000 years. So basically from, you know, agriculture gets invented to Pokemon is about 5,000 years. And yet they decided to fund a project to say, how can we at least make people not visit this terrible waste site uh, for 10,000 years? So, you know, human being lifespan is about 80 to 100 years, and then you want to make it work for twice all known human history or agricultural onward. And they brought in poets, and they brought in scientists, and everything else. And their solutions are interesting because people don't usually think in these kind of long terms. Anyway, one of them was, let's just put a skull and crossbones on it. Problem with skull and crossbones, if you look over to the corner here, there's a skull and crossbones right here because it's meant to be the resurrection. It's the bones of Adam underneath the uh, hung body of Christ so that his life will return again. In other words, it was positive. And that was fine for a long time, except for on ships, the doctors would indicate somebody died en route uh, with a little skull. And so sailors started to think of the skull as bad because it meant somebody was going over the side. And eventually, um, it was used by pirates to strike fear into the heart of sailors. And you would go, well, great, that means it's scary. But it's not scary anymore. Kids have it on lunchboxes now. 
what about, let's have a comic, and here's this comic. Guy goes near thing with symbol, guy has symbol in him, he's a little bit bigger, he's not well. That is fantastic, except that if later cultures read from the bottom up, this guy's not feeling well, well, just stand near the magic rock and you'll feel a lot better. <laughs> That's a problem there, right? So then we start to get into weird. Again, government-funded study. An architect came up with the idea that for 100 miles around, you make a massive, unnegotiable alien landscape of scary, massive, tall, pointy things as a way of saying, this ground is unholy. Whatever's here, you don't want a piece of it. Go away. Except that we're human beings. We'll build a friggin' hotel on this thing <laughs> in about 1,000 years going, wow, whatever this was, was awesome. Right, so let's not do that. But this is my favorite solution that was come up with. Here was the solution. This was the real solution proposed by two philosophers. Breed a line of cats that turn color when near radio wa radioactive waves, then generate a massive amount of culture, songs, and poems, which basically say, if you see a cat change color, run the hell away. <laughs> In the same way that we sing Ring Around the Rosie, or that, um, for instance, with the tsunami, um, you know, we had this tsunami uh, hit back in 2004, and many people died. There was this 90% kill rate in some towns. But a previous tsunami of equal amounts of destruction had hit in the 30s, and it only had a 1% kill rate. And the reason why was because there was this little, you know, thematic thing. If the, if the water pulls out, really far, run the hell away to the hills. And so they knew that, but there had been so much immigration and rotation just, just 60 years later that ended up um, killing many, many more people who didn't know the funny story about running away from the water. And there were people who died one mile from safety because they didn't have that cultural history. So maybe the cat thing was, was fantastic. But um, unfortunately, there's two things that didn't really work out. First of all, this didn't happen, which is a shame. We still have time for the radioactive cat songs to begin. <laughs> so get on that now. Um, they also ended up going with a skull and crossbones, because they're boring. And the company that's in charge of this particular, you know, let's make this thing safe for 10,000 years and in, in lieu of 250,000 years, they already had other dump sites in other parts of the country where people were getting radiation sickness and they had kept things in courts for decades to say, not our fault that the, the glowy, terrible thing is killing children. So the company in charge of let's keep it safe for 10, wasn't even doing it in the present day for actual meat that was dying over in another part of the country. So you know where I function is in that area of instead of the high and mighty and the idea of where are we going to go with this and isn't it amazing how we're in a whole new era of, of wonder, I also go, yeah, but actual people are like in those gears be, while, you're, while your fantasies are going on. Similarly, um, you know, we have this startup culture that has kind of encountered things. Now you're going to go like, Jason, you're very technical, but it sounds almost Luddite. Now when I criticize something like this, it's not because I don't believe in innovation and I don't believe in making things better in iterations. The problem is, is that there's a whole bunch of values that we, we've maintained and some of them have fallen by the wayside in the modern era and, and I happen to be someone who's very loud with a hat who fights those. So startup culture, this wonderful thing, just says it's a party. Isn't it amazing that we are going to have a startup? We have a, we have a machine, we're hosting it, it takes this and turns it to this. We have a Spotify that goes into the Facebook and turns a Twitter into some sort of blogging platform for cats, we have, you know, all of these parties that go on, right? It's an official launch party. We always have a party at the beginning because those are good times. And there are a lot of companies out there. These are just random logos. And, you know, it's funny to me because you look in the 70s and you're like, what's up with the hair? What's up with the rainbows? God, what's up with the strange stripes on the side? And you look at the 80s and you're like, why is everyone made of plastic and has little star makeup on one eye and, and, and yellow glasses? And it, keep, it keeps going on. Well, this is ours. Uh, this is what they're going to make fun of when they're later. They're going to be like, wow, those people in the 2000s loved mooshing two words together and spelling one of them wrong. <laughs> Was everything okay? Was there a rebellion against language? So you have names like Advisia and then Sting and Fortisify. And, and I, I, 
I looked them up, and I always forget what they do, which I guess isn't good, but I've always been in love with wham! <laughs> you get up in the morning, kiss the kids like your father before you, and go to work at wham! down at the docks. Yeah. Um, you know, a startup store. There's, there's all sorts of, of all crazy things. And each one of these is a business and idea, and they're trying to push it to you, right? And they're all meant to be new and, and bright and colorful, right? So what's the end game of these things? Well, the end game is almost always to be acquired. So for instance, here you go. TripAdvisor acquires Wonderfly. Um, Wonderfly is another tr travel thing. And so TripAdvisor bought it. And isn't that great? You do not have to read this. All this says is, oh my god, they bought us. Oh, thank god, we were running on ramen and dreams at the end. <laughs> but here's the thing that I, you know, you know so, so there's the big, you know, the big hullabaloo, everyone shakes hands, and then a little bit quiet later, they write a little thing here, and a little thing here says, you know, a few years ago, we were working on this, that was so amazing, and then we were bought, and um, the Wanderfly site will go offline in about a week. This means your Wonderfly account, profile, and content will no longer be available on the site. Going forward, we hope you will continue to find and share stuff. And this is like saying, you know, it's like a guy shooting you and saying, don't worry, I've got plans for your car, <laughs> right? You are no longer part of the process in this thing. You are somebody else's dream. Uh, they're going to build a little house on your body. Um, and this isn't like me going like, oh, cherry picking. Here's Ancestry plus a thousand memories. This is a company that was based in genealogy. And genealogists are some of the most anal, what about our stuff, let's keep this going people in the world. And so Ancestry plus, a, you know, what this should, right now what this says is, isn't this awesome, we're getting together. What it should say is, <laughs> and what everybody should be doing is freaking out. And they should have because, a Thousand Memories is closing just a few months later with, and I've never figured this out, image of a cat staring into the distance. <laughs> like, here is the road you are hitting. <laughs> and again, you don't have to read at the bottom. During the next month, during the next month, 30 days, you can export your photos to Ancestry.com or download them. After September 15th, all photos will be deleted permanently. We're excited to announce we've been acquired by Instagram. <laughs> we've been acquired by Yahoo, which is the equivalent of saying, we found a lump. <laughs> Second Sync joins Twitter. Quick's exciting new future, which does not include you. <laughs> um, what we have here is you know, an important update. Great news. If you'd like, if you'd like, you can export your data to get a copy of all your ratings and reviews. Thank you for helping make Ness great, which should literally be from the back of a train while dollar bills come out of their pockets. <laughs> this kind of functionality is now accepted as part of the process, right? Which is please let things in. In fact, being the angel of death, people let me know about everything that's dying. And like a cop that sees nothing but murder and the worst parts of humans lying, I now hate everybody because <laughs> Like just this morning, I just got mail from one of, my, uh, one of my many agents in the field who say, well, something died. Jason must surely want to start his morning with this news. Um, there's a company called Pixorial uh, in Centennial, Colorado, who are shutting down. Um, they have 636,000 users. They have 2.1 million minutes of video and quote unquote countless photos and they're being shut down with a 30 day notice with you will never get your stuff after that. So, you know, one of the things that happens in all these wonderful smiling faces is the death of all of this user generated content. And the reason why is because we made a promise to people, we're gonna be your savior, trust us, don't ask too many questions, don't mess it up, and we are going to uh, uh, really, really make a lot of money off of you. And when you're done, it is the curb. Now that would be fine if you had a system that was, uh, um, you know, not dissimilar to a restaurant. You know, like if you look at a restaurant and a restaurant goes out of business, you're like, oh no, my eggs, and you go and get more eggs, right? That's pretty easy. But if it's your only copy of your family photos, and we're certainly getting to the point that people want it that you take a photo, it goes to the cloud service, and um, you, you are never given a local copy, and then you're told randomly within 30 days, as little as a week, the record was, um, well, obviously the record was now. I had that happen a couple times. 
Um, but the record of like they legitimately thought they were giving a shutdown was 24 hours. And they basically say, oh, and due to magic processes that are unlike the last 50 years of computing, there's no trace of your stuff after 30 days, right? That's lawyers talking, right? Because there's a thing called the aqua hire. If you're part of that, shoot yourself. What an aqua hire is, is basically <laughs> where you basically buy a company and you go, there might be liabilities here. Like, like buying a ship and going, there might be stowaways. So you fire everybody from that company, you, on paper, you set the company on fire into the lake, and then you pick up these refugees that are at the shore of this burning Viking company, and the company goes down, taking all those nasty liabilities and patent disputes and everything away. And this is a story that's going on more and more and more, and that's what's going on. So when I see these smiling faces, I'm just like, shut up, because the users are being forgotten. And unfortunately, <laughs> the, the users, here's the thing, right? So, so the users are basically, um, um, you know, left alone uh, with no, not, you know, like the whole point is that you don't want your users to have too much information. There's no number that you know to call for IT support with Facebook. Facebook changes its UI randomly, right? Everything's blue today. Oh, it turns out you don't get chat. Hey, screw you, Zynga, which is actually an awesome side effect. But <laughs> the, uh, the um, oh, did they cry panda tears? And so um, you end up with a whole situation there, right, where uh, the users are just plum forgotten in all of this, right? And we've told culture it's time to go online. And we did it. We won, right? The jocks are using the internet to find out sports scores and watch the World Cup. That's a win in the win column. But we've also told young mothers to use their phones to take their first baby photos. We've told genealogists to use the internet and cloud services to store their material. We've told people to express themselves online, to put their writings online. And in many cases, I get a lot of geeks who are like, well, I would keep backups. And that's like walking up to a car accident and going, I would have worn my seatbelt. Right? You're not helping. It's just engineering wise, we've gotten into this situation. And I don't really, you know, I understand where we've gone with this, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I, and I totally understand how we got there. But one of the things I've been trying to do is work with all sorts of things to kind of change and be, if nothing else, a figure people can make fun of or bring up or whatever and go, you know, I, there has been one case of a place shutting down really quickly, specifically to avoid me. Um, sorry about that. But the others, I have now had situations where I call them and they go, yeah, we know who you are. And I'm more than happy to be that, right? Um, here's the thing about links, right? So, the, uh, so, so the internet archive crawls, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fuzzing this number a little bit because it changes year by year, but the internet archive crawls billions of URLs every year and stores them. And if you've ever used the Wayback Machine, that's the Internet Archive. Um, yep, oh yeah. And the Internet Archive recrawls those URLs and they find something like 40 to 50% are gone the next year. So there's this massive overturn, right? The, 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 the statistic that's cited is 40% of all URLs cited in Supreme Court decisions are now gone. You know, there, you have a situation there where we thought that URLs were forever and they're so not, right? And how are you gonna fight it, right? So, so, so you know, places like GeoCities, which were there from the beginning, and at one point GeoCities was the third largest browse site, well, it was shut down with almost no notice, and I was angry about this, and I made noise, and I founded a group, um, uh, and the reason that group was started was because of stuff like this. There was a photo site called Tableau. It took me forever to get the joke. It's a Tableau with an L-E-A-U. Okay, got it, right, great. I didn't get that. And what you do is you took photos and you told the story at the bottom. And this is a particularly tragic one. This is a guy with photos of his house burning down. And he says, yeah, I lost everything, but luckily I have my 5,000 pictures on Tableau. And a month later, they deleted them all. Yeah! Oh, look, the human element. So, um, now the reason you can even see this is because I'm part of a group that went in and took all the photos out of Tableau and put them on the Internet Archive. 
to be used for later. Um, and we still get letters of thank you from mothers who it's the only photos of their kids and they came back from something, checked on their site and went, oh my God, everything's gone. And we, functioning as their backup, were able to do it. We're part of a group called Archive Team, an A-team. And what the idea of the Archive Team is, is they are another court of last resort fighting against um, this weird user shift aside. And what it's meant to be, it's a group of extremely angry archivists, one of the finest groups you can ever imagine. How do you tell an extroverted archivist? They're the ones looking at your shoes when they talk? <laughs> yeah. But they're headed up by me, a maniac, and so that's how it's going to go. And the idea with Archive Team is that Archive Team goes after, and we're the one technical group that may step in and go, but what about the users? So we created something, for instance, called the Archive Team Warrior. The Archive Team Warrior is a virtual box-based system. Um, the best example I can give is basically archive at home. And so what happens is, is that you boot this up on your machine, and when we find out a site with millions of accounts is going down, we initiate a preservation of service attack. And what we do is, we basically run in with hundreds and hundreds of machines and download every copy of everything once from these sites that are like, oh, magical beans tell us we're going to be down in 30 days. And we go, that's interesting, and we just download everything they have. For instance, we downloaded MobileMe. That was 300 terabytes. We downloaded um, GeoCities in a few months. We were able to download Tableau. We, we wrecked a site called Vidler. We caused a um, Italian GeoCity site, which was basically GeoCities with nudity, um, <laughs> to uh, extend their uh, closure deadline by 60 days because nobody else could get in while we downloaded a copy of everything. So we're not everybody's buddy, but we've been able to rescue well close to a petabyte of data that was just going to be deleted in the last five years, right? When you run the Archive Team Warrior, it has the most important motivator in the modern world, a leaderboard. So this one, for instance, you can see that um, Kenneth is winning. Kenneth has downloaded 64 terabytes um, and 88,489 users. And then over here is this constantly scrolling um, set of who we've downloaded. And these are all usernames that we've discovered that we pulled down. So we're trying to keep the conversation going, right? A preservation discussion about building ends when the developer knocks the building down, right? They just want to knock it down. But we stop before they knock it down and go, oh, it looks like you dropped the building. Here it is. And that's how we get in. Great. Here's an example of just how we work. Um, in the beginning, we kind of analyze it. We try to figure out what the system is about. We try to make sure we can get, grab things. We have to write custom scripts. Then we give it to the warriors, and then the fun begins with the items per hour and, and how fast we're going. And by the end, it's pretty hairy. But we have, we have been able to grab all the related data of a bunch of things. Now, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I happen to think it's a good thing. That's kind of what we're in for. Um, also, I'm more than happy to be the outreach guy. Um, I have had more than one heated conversation with people and have been able to have some pretty good ones. Um, my all-time favorite would... Um, have to be posterous, who will not like that I just said their name. Um, the head CEO called me the Glenn Beck of archivists. <laughs> and uh, we made a backdoor deal with them, which was basically give us a machine that we can download from and we'll stop downloading from all your machines. And we did it. And then we gave their lead engineer a cake and I showed up at his, at his building. They'd been bought by Twitter. See, Twitter bought them, posterous and deleted the 6.7 million accounts a year later, having never transferred them to new servers because of this aqua hire thing. So we got in there and Posterous is saved. And it's always nice to get on the phone with people. Why are you here? Here's an example of just culture being gone, right? This is, this is, a, this is a guy in space singing space oddity. That's awesome. Oh my god, that's awesome. And, and so, you know, this guy is singing in space, but apparently they had made some sort of bizarre licensing deal where they didn't know what to negotiate with the record company for. We're allowed to do this cover for one year, and then we have to take it down. In lieu of what? That's what kills me. I'm like, do you really seriously think David Bowie is selling less records because this guy in space sang your song? Also, he's in space. You can't touch him. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to process serve one of these bastards? <laughs> it is really expensive. OK? Anyway, so they deleted it, 22 million views. And that would be whatever. 
This is what we have now instead. Sorry about that. Um, but what kills me is 74,000 comments just went into the ether, just gone. Now people can say, yeah, but they're YouTube comments. <laughs> so here's the thing, here's how we destroy all cultures, here's how we absolutely wreck people, this is how we get rid of ideas. Um, disenfranchise, demean, delete. Disenfranchise, you take away anybody's ability to have any kind of a say. So if you're a user, you don't really have any say over the process of Facebook. You don't have any say over where Twitter goes. You don't have any real voice. Facebook tried to add a voice, but they did it in a really geeky, techy way that was crap, and they immediately got rid of it. So it was this fake democracy. It was like e-democracy light 2 plus plus minus k low pixel rate. Then you demean. Then you say, well, these people are below us. These are YouTube commenters, okay? They can't even get on the same bus as us. These people should be drinking from whatever's in their water we should not be drinking. Filter it, don't touch their hands. And then you delete them, because who cares? These disenfranchised, demeaned people are gone. Boom, that's the formula we've been doing it for 2,000 years, maybe 5,000 years, depending on who you talk to. And so I'm saying no. You know, every single cool thing we have that's hundreds of years old is an unbroken uh, chain of people agreeing to do nothing. Not deleting it, not throwing it out, not going like, oh God, who could possibly want this shroud of Turin and dumping it out the back door? <laughs> or being, um, being like, wow, this Picasso guy was an idiot and just burning them because you need to add some new spaces for a mural. You know, we, 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 we actively have to choose to do nothing. And so what the archive team does is just say, okay, somebody in 50 years can make a different decision because we're going to be gone, but we're just going to grab all of these websites into you know, a few petabytes, which by the time we get to the 50s, we'll, in the, two, you know, the 2050s is going to be like you know, this little thumbnail hologram that everyone keeps a copy on. It's like, what's this? Oh, all of human history. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dot B-A-K. And, and just work with that, right? Like, we want to be that person, right? Um, and so people go like, aren't you hoarding? And, and I'm like, you know, the thing is, is that every time we want to talk about, you know, like data hoarding, to me, that's just like a simple, simple cop out. People just go, oh God, you know, that's too much. You'll never keep track of it. But if you look at the, you know, obviously we're going to hit plateaus with disk space, but I still have some faith that we're going to come up with other methodologies for storing that will continue. The thing is, is that stuff that was intolerably huge in the 90s is now a rounding error today, right? Um, the Internet Archive has all of Usenet from 1981 to 1991. It's 208 megabytes, b-zipped. We can hold it. <laughs> I just used 200 megabytes on this presentation. <laughs> so, so we can do it. And, and so I got to keep that faith, right? I got to keep the faith that we're going to continue to innovate. That's, that's the hand part, right? The top one is 64 gigs. The bottom one is 64 megs. Um, this has seen some crap. You can just see it. You can't see it right here, but if you, if you look at it on the thing, you're like, wow, dude, you, you had a hard day. Um, but now we're at 64 gigs. And so, you know, my attitude is, um, the robots that come, you know, that will analyze things, you know. It's now, to, like, you know, Facebook is great because Facebook is like this beautiful way to see the dystopian robot meat hook, hook future that's coming, <laughs> right? Isn't it great how they just quietly one day, you know, you could tag people who are in your photos and one day it said, do you want to tag your husband since this is who he is? Or do we all want to pretend it's not him? And people go, oh, I'll show them. I'll say it's not him. And then it goes, that's nice. Here's all your friends who know him. Anybody else want to tag him? <laughs> if one of you does, all of you have. So anyway, welcome. And so the ability of machines to go back and look at old footage and old photos and figure out what they are. I mean, we're already at the point you could tell how many people are in the shot and everything else. I mean, I don't have any fear that this data can't be gone through. That's all. You know, so when, when, when you know, That is really touching. <laughs> that somebody, oh, the sad, frowny little floppy disk is holding. I, I, I just want to point, these two guys really friggin' hate each other. <laughs> like, they're all, it's like when you have the band that gets like Pink Floyd, that one last performance they all did together. No, they still hate each other. But, 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 but here, yeah, they're, for the, it, this is just for the shot. 
and, and this guy doesn't even know who they are. <laughs> and, and this guy, you can see it from the look on his face, that's how he is all the time. Just, <laughs> his face is frozen in, a, in, in just this nightmarish look. So, so no, it's, there's a lot of darkness behind this. And, um, but anyway, that's good to know. Um, I'm mostly saying here that, um, you know, the way that we keep things going as a culture is to not go for a culture of forgetting. Uh, certainly if you guys are involved in law, you know this, that like every time a lawyer farts, it gets, you know, transcribed. And it's kept for 100 years and can be, you know, fart matrixed and everything else. Um, I've been, I was in a court case recently, for example, um, not as a defendant this time, which was pretty awesome. <laughs> I've been tried in Middlesex. It's kind of a nice place if, if you, you know, don't care about anything. And um, it stands above everything else in this terrifying column of, of law misery, like overlooking. That's where the laser towers will go in the future. Um, anyway, so the, um, the, as, as a you know, testimony, as a, I said, am I an expert witness? And the lawyer looked at me and went, witness. <laughs> um, here was the testimony. It was to invalidate six software patents, which were in fact invalidated. Screw you guys. And... <laughs> Yeah, it was actually a patent, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's a patent on having a file that tells you how secure and intact the other files are. And VMware and EMC were working together to fight this patent. And they needed proof that somebody had this, this idea recent to when the patent was done, and it all came down to a 19, an October 1993 shareware CD that had a utility on it that used this functionality and had a massive here's how it worked function. And oh my God, were they fighting it. And my job was to be the old guy who has all this old stuff and prove that opening a zip file was not an insurmountable monkeys looking at the monolith process in 1993 <laughs> and that it was possible to read a text file without word. It was, it was, you know, it was basically these, I mean, and I understand what they were doing. When you are a thief and a liar, you have to say everything as to why you are doing what you're doing. You know, I'm putting a cookie back in the jar. And so they were like, well, CDs aren't publishing. The company that made it, which owns CDROM.com, wasn't very prominent. It didn't sell very well. Shareware CDs aren't real. This guy next to us isn't real. It was a, it was a great time. Um, and I'll tell you, when I've shown people the transcript, it's just horror. But the thing was, it all depended on me having a 20-year-old CD-ROM. And because of that, millions were at stake. So history matters, right? Um, I just wanted to show you this little bit here. Um, so this is the Internet Archive Scanning Center. It's not quite the Internet Archive Scanning Center as of last year. It actually had a little problem. Um, and it burned down. So it actually looks like this. It doesn't look like this anymore. We've now actually wiped it out. It's actually a space, and we're trying to rebuild, and we're taking donations, and life is pretty good in terms of donations. The more people, the better, to understand who we are. It actually revealed for a moment an old alcohol ad along this wall. Um, we also were down for eight hours. Um, people were like, so what did you lose? And we lost surprisingly little. Um, this is a power junction box. And it turned out the power junction box did not have a contingency for I am on fire. <laughs> so it stopped talking to home because it was burning. And the other junction boxes said, when that happens, something really bad is happening. So they went to Tahiti as well. So we were down for eight hours. We didn't lose any online data. We did lose a few boxes of items to be scanned. Half the items had been scanned. They burned. Um, and I don't know how we explain it to the people who gave it to us to scan. But then again, we lost stuff too. So everybody was having a bad day. Um, and what I'll always remember about my boss uh, in this moment was it all happened at like 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning. And he was interviewed by the local paper you know, like person going like this in front of him at four in the morning. And they commented in it that he was, quote unquote, surprisingly upbeat and chipper. Um, and the reason for that is because my boss sees things like this as massive opportunities and chances to rebuild. He's already trying to rebuild something bigger there. He's trying to reimagine what the building could be. He wants to be able to create more societal improvement from it. You know, and that's the thing. Yes, in all of this destruction that I'm describing, and all this destruction we fight, there's always a chance for renewal. I think that a few minor tweaks 
to make it so that we have, if not laws, we have mores and expectations that lost data, user data is meaningful. I understand HIPAA is a terrible thing in terms of paperwork, but it's good to have at least some guidelines as opposed to just, where is it running? I don't know. Uh, which is what we're doing, right? Where to go? I don't care. It's not exactly the best approach. So besides saving things while we change society, my hope is that as you go forward, there'll be a room that you are in, either functioning as a lawyer or a tech or an admin. And in that room, they're going to make a decision to build a massive rototiller and throw all of the users into it. And my hope is that you'll raise your hand in a shaky way and say, have we considered Amazon Glacier? Have we considered some policy for storing it with a group and making it? Can we make an export function now? Like when I work with a place that's new, I show up and go, so where's your export function? And if they tell you it's a technical impossibility, they're lying. They're lying. You can drag your entire life into the big fat smiling face and have it imported into their service. You can certainly drag it out of the big frowny face and get it back. I'm not too worried about that. And yeah, go ahead and browbeat them and go, we're really sorry to see that you don't trust us. But please, you know, if you can have any influence on that, it would make my life so much easier because guiding a group of archivists who are really angry is one of the most scary things in the world. I would like for us to be able to step back and enjoy ourselves. So um, what I really want more than anything is for the angel of death to just walk on by and never look at you again. So thank you very much. I'm sort of. Time for questions. I always have time for questions. We have time for questions. I definitely have time for questions. As much as you guys can stand. What, uh, does anyone? Does anyone? You can. You can ask a terrible question. I, I like terrible questions. Just try not to do a speech about yourself in which you are the hero. <laughs> yes. I'm, it strikes me as ironic that all these petabytes of data are stored in San Francisco, which it's going to have a mass burn. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Internet Archive is located in San Francisco. Um, they, have, they have one data service that's on the water in Santa Monica. They have one that's on an earthquake fault line. Um, and they have a third one, which is in, there's some other joke that we have about that one. Um, yeah, you know, here's the thing. Okay, so the Internet Archive is a nonprofit run by a, a wonderful, crazy millionaire who uh, saw this dream and is doing it. Some people are under the impression that we're a government agency. We're not. Some people think that we have a lot of money. We don't. It costs about $12 million for everything. People, equipment, bandwidth, everything else per year. Which to me, you know, that's roughly 24 Facebook parties. And I would love for us to be able to get more donations, um, more places that we host. Um, we have small amounts in other countries, but I would love to see increased stuff around the world. Um, instead of saying, well, this isn't perfect, let's, let's, we're stop. Let's, let's not do it at all. I would much rather be open about like, yup. <laughs> you know, we actually use the servers to heat the building. Uh, we actually reuse the heat from the servers into the building uh, to save money on heat. And it is possible to get too hot. And then we will shut some of the servers down. We will do that. We can do that. We don't have a EULA. Um, <laughs> You know, we just go ahead and, and, and do what we can. And, and you know, in, in the span of human history, a 10-year period, a five-year period, where it was all being kept in this relatively shaky period, is no different to me than a lot of other cases of human history being shoved under a bed, put inside of an attic, kept inside a cave, buried in some chest. We do that. I would love for us to have alternate large places. Money comes with that. So if one of you guys wants to give us a lot of money, I know just where we're going to spend it. Yes. Yes, sir. So just, just to clarify, this is targeted archiving. It's not a giant NSA scooping up everything in sight. So I love NSA jokes. Um, so the thing with the NSA doing what they do, yeah, I mean, I believe me, that's, that's um, it's nice to finally have that thing that makes you shift in your seat and kind of move your, your glass around. You know, where it's like if you're a lawyer, it's like, well, don't sue me, har, har, har. And, and the thing is, is that, yes, the NSA has an even better backup operation than we do. 
but their utilization of the data is, is, is uh, completely on a different focus, and their open license sucks. And so we're going to assume, and they've also shown a annoyingly transient retention policy based on attention. So um, I'm going to assume that most of that stuff we're not going to be allowed to see. And so um, in terms of can this data be used for misuse? Of course it can. It's data. Data is a knife. Sometimes it opens up a person. Sometimes it opens up a package of chips. It doesn't really make a decision based there. Um, if you thought that you were going to put something online and say, hey, billions of people, take a look at this, and then be flabbergasted like Goofy in a Disney cartoon that somebody actually kept a copy, um, you didn't read the pamphlet. And, and the thing is, is um, a lot of what we're getting here are public-facing parts of culture. So for instance, um, there's a group called ArchiveBot. That's one of our sub... Okay, so here's an example of other archive teams. Um, we're grabbing lots and lots and lots of URL shortener links because URL shorteners are the single worst idea in computing in the last hundred years. By far. By far. You're going to let some group of random people keep a one-time cryptographic pad for the linking of information. This is amazing. Go to this impossible to, to look at thing. So we've just been downloading every URL shortener all the time. And some of them are as little as 200 items, and some of them are reusing. So you have to know what year you're in to be able to do it, because there's no regulation. Who cares? This is all meant to be transient. But in the future, when someone says, go to our URL shortener, I understand URL shorteners on a per site basis. Like if you have uh, Harvard and you have HVRD dot, you know, money, dollar sign, dollar sign, um, <laughs> slash whatever. I understand that. Like that makes sense to me. And then you're keeping it local. But when you just say, hey, random company, I, I really trashed um, Bitly just before a speech by a Bitly engineer. But she quit the next day, so it was pretty good. Um, <laughs> but you know, uh, I, 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 we download every wiki we can find. We've been downloading 35,000 wikis. We download the whole of Wikipedia once a month. Um, we download something called ArchiveBot. And ArchiveBot is a crowdsourced culture information search. And what that means is there's 80 people who have the right to tell ArchiveBot what to archive. And so um, it's interesting because it again is this bizarre kind of dystopian sad librarian when this thing works. Because I will watch ArchiveBot stuff and if I see somebody's personal website, their official website, news articles, I'll be like, he's dead because it meant that they just went, oh God, we gotta grab everything from this person. When Gaddafi was deposed, we grabbed every official Libyan site. And a, year, and, a, and a week later, they got the greatest takedown notice ever. Take everything down or we will kill you. <laughs> Which was what their ISP got from the rebels. So we have a copy of everything Gaddafi had to say. And you're like, oh, well, why don't we just bury that guy? Well, how do you learn if you don't see what his own vision of himself was and what he was saying? So, you know, Detroit, um, we grabbed a lot of Detroit when Detroit went bankrupt. We went after uh, companies. We, you know. So this is a case of, yes, does it mean we're in a constant state of, you're going to die. I'm going to get you in a bag, take you home until later. Yeah, it's creepy. Can't stop that. But we're just trying to make it so that in 50 years, someone goes, oh, thank God for those idiots, <laughs> which we think will happen. We can hope for it. Um, any other questions? Yes. Can you think of ways to reconcile the wonderful work of the Internet Archive with the right to be forgotten? The right to be forgotten. One of my favorite phrases in the world. It's a misnomer. I don't like the, I don't like the phrase. I don't like the phrase. Because you remember that they asked to be forgotten. Like, it's, 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 it's a Streisand approach. I totally understand that you would say magically, that you don't want any record of you. The Internet Archive will dark out and remove items from the... Po okay, so... <laughs> I do not speak for my employer. Um, okay, so... As you might know, working in law, I was asked to make this relevant to law without twisting myself into being something stupid, because apparently previous speakers have twisted themselves into a 
problem trying to be relevant to lawyers. But here's the thing, right? 99% of the time with many legal cases, you, it's not necessarily what the legal case is. What you often do is you want to sit down with the person and go, what are you trying to do? Like, are you just trying to hurt your ex? Are you trying to buy this thing? Is that what you're trying to do by suing them over here? And then you negotiate it and you work out what you really want. So what is the right to be forgotten? The right to be forgotten is to, is to not let people know that five years ago you were a bassist in the flaming shitstorms because now you're a father of two. That's what you want. You want it that when you search for your name, flaming shitstorms with a logo you now see in your mind <laughs> is not the first hit. Because if it says, whatever your name is, CPA, and whatever your name is, Flaming Shitstorms, you're going to click on the first, second link. I'm sorry, you are. <laughs> and it's going to be whatever. OK, is that what you really want? We'll do that. We'll make it that it's not in search engines. We'll make it that it's stored away with a note saying, wait for them to die. And, and everyone, 99% of the time, is happy. Um, the cases where somebody wants to be wiped off the face of the earth, I've only had one. That person had cancer. He wrote me and he said, fuck these people, fuck this world, it screwed me. I want no evidence I was here. Take me away, delete me. I'll leave to the side what I did, but that was a legitimate person with a dying request, right? And, but the amount of them that are in the right to be forgotten that are that, I think are extremely minimal. I'd much rather, instead of robots making that decision, that we still keep it on a case-by-case -case uh, thing and negotiate with a person. Um, what we currently have with the DMCA is somebody writes to you and says, take that down because I'm angry. And they often take it down for discussion. And we've already seen cases of companies issuing thousands of false DMCA requests to keep things out for 30 days because what they're really trying to do is promote this. So we're already seeing it twisted, but the idea was to protect people. So instead you say, how about if we're just ethical? <laughs> how about if we talk with people? Because to me, ethics aren't something that you can, you can make into a Perl script and then work it from there. These are not the views of my employer. Jason is completely insane. <laughs> Jason requires a whole range of medicine which he left at home and is unable to take at this moment. We hope to have him discussed later. Do we want to get one last question? One last awesome question. You sound like the biggest big data that there is, right? You're the granddaddy of big data. I would not say that. I sound like I use a lot of data. Um, currently, I believe Facebook acquires, f it's something, it's well over 100 terabytes a day of data. We're not big data. We're, we're angry little hippie data. But go ahead with the rest of your question. So how much staff and is, it, is there just technologies that handle that now, just like the compression for storage? How much staff do you have to address these data, data and is there new technologies that do help you scale them now? Without going into too much data here, because I think that it would be of relevant interest to people, the Internet Archive is pretty open about how we do things and how we approach it. Um, you can see the logs for any given item. What happens is that when you upload an item, a round of about 100 tests are executed about it to go, like, is this a movie? Is this data? Is this music? Try to make derivatives of it. We always make the original data available, which is unlike a lot of these other places. So you can always get the original 17 gig AVI, but we'll also supply the MP4. We'll also supply an OGV and derive them. We have OCR that runs against it, so we can try to derive keywords from it. You know, we do a whole bunch of automatic, and then we have a brave set of people uh, who I will happily say is Tracy, Sam, Ralph, um, Alex, Kyle, and somebody who's going to get angry because I didn't mention them, um, and I'm sorry. Raj, um, who watch, who get told when one of the millions of processes has floated upside down in the fish tank, and then we have other tools to fix it, you know? But I don't think what we're doing is any different than what Facebook or Netflix or anything else are doing in terms of keeping track of it. And is it perfect? No. 
Do people upload spam? Yes. Do people send us junk? Yes. And we deal with it. But right now, we are trying to be you know, a bunch of things that, to be frank, should have been there from the beginning. And so if it's, if it's not perfect, eh, eh. So there you go. That's my last word, eh. <laughs> Thank you. All right, it gives us a 15-minute break, and then let's have a conference. <laughs>